so thank you all uh, for being here today. We have released the One Calgary budget document, which is really our roadmap of what the next four years will look like here at the city. So I'm going to go through a few things first, then we'll open up to questions on the budget, uh, and then at the end we'll have just a bit of time for any questions on, I don't know, any other issues that you might want to talk about. I can't imagine what those might be. So first of all, this is a very different business plan for the City of Calgary. It's actually a service plan, and we have fundamentally reorganized how we think of ourselves and also on how we communicate with citizens here around these critical lines of service that are really how citizens are affected. It's another move in my and our ongoing program of transforming government to put citizens at the center of what we do. So to give you a simple example, we have a roads department and we have a parks department, each of whom partially are responsible for snow clearing on sidewalks and pathways. And so rather than have those in separate budgets and separate departments, we now have one service line, sidewalks and pathways, because it really is focused on how citizens perceive their government so that citizens can more clearly see the value for their money. We've also done the process quite differently this year than we've done in the past. So in September, we had a whole month of going through every one of those services uh, at the committee level, inviting public input and providing direction up, down, stay the same on every one of those services, and that's never happened before. I'll remind you that the way the City of Calgary does its budgeting is unique among governments in this country. You know, when the provincial or federal budget comes out, I sit there and listen to it on the radio or watch it on TV and try and figure out what's happened. It's the first I've ever heard of it. And then it's passed. There's usually some, you know, futile debate and then it gets passed. And this is actually very, very different. We create the budget, as we do most things here, in conjunction with citizens. And we continue to have that conversation. We've had every single service owner come live on TV and on the web in front of council or committee to talk about what it is they do and to help citizens better understand what they do and have these very open debates. And we will continue to do that. So we've done a bunch of that already this year. That's different than in the past. So that was done in September. And based on council's feedback, my colleagues at the City of Calgary tried to incorporate what they could into the tax rate that council had approved in the spring. And now council gets the document. It's our document now. And we will spend some time thinking about what we agree with, what we'd like to see more investment in, what we might want to see less investment in. Those conversations will happen informally over the next 10 days and then formally in council chambers on budget week. Before I go any further, I just want to say thank you to the dozens and dozens and dozens of my colleagues at the city who have been working on this uh, document over the last year. I think they've done a great job of balancing off some very impossible considerations. So let's get to the numbers. Council earlier had suggested that we want to both approve 14 new communities in the city of Calgary, so we have pre-approved a 0.75% tax increase uh, that every Calgarian will pay for greenfield development. In addition to that, while developers pay 100% of the costs of new development that directly impacts only their own development, the city has a portion of costs on larger things like road interchanges and so on that we anticipate will benefit the city a bit more widely. So for the first time this year, we've also broken that out into our budget. So there is um, another 1.5% in 2019 that is going towards that. So in total, roughly, if I've got my numbers right, 2.5% uh, is already spoken for going to uh, these new communities which means that we, our tax increase for 2019 is 1.3%, not accounting for growth, and then in 2020 to 2022, about 2%, 2.6% each year, which continues our pattern of increasing taxes less than inflation plus growth. But I want to highlight something, that even given that, well, let me just translate that sort of to what those percentages are so uh, sterile. Let me translate that first to what that means for the average household. So it means that in 2019, the average household will pay a little bit less than $10 additionally per month. And in 2020, 21, and 22, that number will be less than $5 per month. 
I want to be clear, this is not an austerity budget. I don't know where people have gotten that idea. This is a budget that invests in stuff that people have told us is important to them while holding the line, as we always do on taxes and ensuring that our taxes remain the lowest in the country for our residences. But we are making investments. We're making investments in transit, we're making investments in snow and ice control, in police, in management of our facilities, in sidewalks, and in affordable housing. We found $500 million, a half billion dollars in efficiencies in our budget over the last four years, and we've budgeted in another $100 million um, in this four-year budget cycle. In terms of capital, things that we're building, we will continue to build the things that Calgary needs, whether it's roads, water and sewer pipes, recreation and community facilities. So the total capital investment over the course of the next four-year cycle will be over $5 billion. That includes $2 billion in previously approved capital and $3 billion in proposed capital. We've got a lot of issues facing us. Council approved these 14 new communities earlier this year, and we've got to make sure that we're paying for them. In the past, before, before I was in this job, Council would approve new communities and not pay for them. And as a result, our debt grew, and future councils had to face very different difficult decisions. Or you ended up with communities like Evanston in north central Calgary that were built without adequate transportation infrastructure, not, not enough roads to get in and out. So we don't do that anymore. And we went into this decision eyes wide open, ensuring that if we were going to fund this growth, we would be transparent about it and we would fund it so that every taxpayer could see it. And we have to find that balance between supporting growth and managing the associated costs of growth. In addition, we have this 2.5% or so in there for brand new communities at the edge of the city, but we don't have any dedicated funding for established communities for older neighborhoods that need their sidewalks, their sidewalks fixed and their pipes upgraded, or for businesses along these main streets that require a better streetscape in order to be able to thrive as businesses. So that's a question we're really going to have to think about. How in the world are we going to make sure that our existing communities also benefit from the prosperity in this place? We also have not looked at any major capital projects in, in the context of this budget. It doesn't mean they won't happen. It means we'll look at them outside of the context of this budget, whether that is an expansion of the BMO Convention Center, whether it's Arts Commons, whether it's a new arena. And the other thing to remind, remember as well is that the provincial government has not announced their replacement for capital grants. We do not have a fiscal framework in place, so it's difficult for us to think about our capital without knowing all of that. So very, very, very briefly, I'm going to go through some of the highlights of the budget so that we have them here within the context of the priorities the council has set. The first priority is a prosperous city. Under a prosperous city, we've got a real focus on what we call business friendly. It's the evolution of my cut red tape program. And the idea there is to make sure that Calgary remains the best place in Canada to start and grow a business. We're holding planning and building fees at 2016 levels. We're holding business licensing fees at 2018 levels. We're implementing the Calgary Economic Strategy. And we're continuing to with a real focus on low-income Calgarians, ensuring everyone can share in the prosperity of this place. We'll continue to support programs and services for them, including affordable housing. And of course, Council recently approved Canada's first ever community strategy on mental health and addiction. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. Second priority is city of safe, inspiring neighborhoods. We'll continue to advance programs connected to our anti-poverty strategy, our seniors age friendly strategy, and social well-being principles. And we will continue the implementation of main streets across the city, as well as a real focus, for obvious reasons, on the center city and on downtown Calgary. A city that moves. There's money in here to implement our pedestrian strategy, as well as our safer mobility plan. Tomorrow I will be launching the largest expansion in transit service in Calgary's history with the expansion of three of the first max rapid transit services. And of course, we're in the midst of building the Green Line, bringing primary transit closer to every single Calgarian. We'll continue to enhance the public realm through our Main Street strategy. And we're improving customer experience and accessibility by adding specialized transit service. 
accessible taxi service, and improving snow clearing, particularly for pedestrians. A healthy and green city. Climate change is real. Climate change impacts municipalities more than any others, and we have to continue to look after our impacts on our land, on our air, and on our water. That means we'll continue to care for our tree canopy. It means we'll invest in flood protection measures. We'll protect our rivers and our green spaces. We'll continue to make sure that citizens have clean, safe drinking water 100% of the time, every day, every hour. And we will look after our waste and recycling. And of course, in January, we will open the largest YMCA in the world, in the community of Seton, making the Rocky Ridge YMCA the second largest YMCA in the world. And we continue to focus on recreation, on sports, and on healthy communities for children. So, where does that leave us? Calgary has the lowest residential property taxes among 11 Canadian municipalities. When you include utility charges and property taxes, the Cal Calgary remains lower than the average for the 11 surveyed municipalities. If you're interested, that's Calgary, Medicine Hat, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Halifax, Regina, Edmonton, Toronto, Lethbridge, Ladue, at random, and Vancouver. As well as the 2017 Canadian Property Tax Rate Benchmark Report shows that Calgary has the second lowest residential property tax rate of its major municipalities. We continue to achieve a high rating of AA+, among the top for Canadian municipalities, and we remain one of the lowest costs for business to operate anywhere in Canada. This, build, this budget builds on our success. It continues to provide the services that people want and need when they need them, all at a very, very affordable cost. So I look forward to our discussions over the next couple of weeks. Questions? Are you concerned at all about, so you mentioned uh, business friendly and talked a lot about residential tax rates there. Are you concerned at all about the potential increases we could see with the business tax rate? We heard this morning it could be as high as 25%. And yeah. what happens? Yeah, so the, uh, the issue here is that on average, our business tax rates are very, very, very competitive. The problem is those words on average. Because of the uh, high downtown vacancy rate, it means that downtown businesses are going to get a huge decline in their taxes this year. It's going to go way down. The businesses outside of the downtown, in order to make up for that, are looking at rather large increases. So Council is well aware of this problem, and we've understood it for the last couple of years. And what I say to those small businesses outside of the downtown is, we've got your back. We've had your back the last couple of years. We probably will not be able to do the same thing we did in the last two years, which is let everyone keep their decreases, but anyone who is increasing cap it at 5%. But there are creative solutions out there, and we'll have a solution to that in January. Sir, Mr. Bailey says they're building, he's built in enough money. It's in $40 million range, but of course that would allow for an increase of you know, more than 25%. Is that acceptable? Well, I think it's a start, um, but certainly it's hard for me to say to small businesses, don't worry, only a 25% increase. So we will, you know, it's not going to be worse than that, let's put it that way. But I'm still hopeful that we will be able to cobble together solutions that will provide more relief to those businesses that need it the most. Long term or is another year or another both. You know, we've got to solve the short-term problem, but we also have to solve the long-term structural problem. And there are many ideas out there. Ultimately, the right idea is economic growth. Ultimately, the right idea is filling up those downtown spaces, but we cannot hang those businesses out to dry while that happens. There are some changes to transit as well, with the uh, moving back from the four-car trains. And <coughs> possibly there could be some ridership issues with the too many people on the trains. And Ride, yeah, let's be clear, that's not actually happening. <laughs> this uh, this is one of those persistent myths. I feel like I'm doing a lot of myth busting these days. That's not actually happening. So what may happen is that over a long period of time, as those very old 40, 45 year old trains start to not be able to be on the tracks anymore, we may have fewer cars on the tracks. That's uh, very subjective. And what this budget actually does is it puts more money into maintenance to keep those trains going longer. Ultimately, we have to replace them. And citizens who ride those U2 trains and know what happens with the heat from the brakes on hot summer days know that we have to replace them. Um, that said, there is no imminent danger of cutting back from four-car to three-car trains anytime soon. Does it still show the importance of the Green Line as well, though? 
Yeah, and remember too, we are in the middle of the largest investment in transit in our history, both with the uh, MAX, I keep wanting to call it BRT, the MAX Rapid Transit Service. That sounds very 1990s to me. MAX convenience, MAX safety, and we launch it tomorrow. Um, but in addition to that, of course, the Green Line, which is by far the largest public works investment we've ever made. So, you know, Council has clearly shown that transit is a major priority for us and we continue to invest in it. Anything you want to say to the uh, average Calgarians going to look at this and say, my property taxes are going up, are we going to have to pay more? Well, you know, look at that average cost uh, per month per year, $10 a month, uh, $5 a month after 2020, and fundamentally ask yourself, you know, is that worth it for the services I receive? Uh, whether that's police, fire, transit, roads, 911, you know, those four things alone are the vast majority of our city budget, um, as well as uh, the utility rates and managing waste and recycling and water. Again, we have still the lowest property, residential property taxes in any major city in Canada, and there's no plan of changing that. What would you, be the flip side of that, sir, which would be that people would say, I need a break. I know you're providing the services that you just listed, but can I get a break on my property taxes? What would you say? Well, this is the decision we make every day. What are you willing to give up? And uh, these are the conversations that we have with citizens every single day, and I don't mean to be flip about it. But when you think about those services, when you think, look at our citizen satisfaction survey from last year, and you'll see similar things this year, that when we ask people should we be investing the same more or less in our services, every single service, every single one, citizens say invest the same or more, including cycle tracks, if you can believe it. And so, you know, once we have that as your governors, as people who've been elected to do this job, we have to make pretty tough decisions because we can't afford to give everybody everything and keep taxes low. But ultimately, we come up with something that makes sense uh, for us. And I think most Calgarians would say, you know, you keep it up with inflation, that makes sense, and that's precisely what we're doing here. Do you think it's realistic to find $100 million in the next couple of years in, in uh, Texas? Yes. Um, you know, we found half a billion over the last four years. There's a, declining, there's a declining return on this stuff. After you find the easy stuff, the rest of the stuff becomes harder. But one of the things that has been very, very clear since I've been mayor is our operate, the, the tax increase for our operating budget has been below inflation plus population growth every single year. And that's because we have really created a culture in this place of, I don't want to say scarcity, that's going too far, but a culture of efficiency. You know, the words red tape are dirty words around City Hall. And my colleagues at the city are always focused on finding ways to do it better and do it more efficiently, you know. Sometimes I read stories about the other orders of government, and I just think of how impossible that would be for that to happen here. You well, pushed... I know they said earlier that it wouldn't necessarily be employment jobs. Where, where is the obvious thing that would Well, you know, the first half million, half billion dollars, the first 500 million, uh, came from certainly some jobs. It came from thinking about automation and how we can do things better. It came from technological efficiencies. It came from managing our capital budget better so that there weren't sort of bits of money sitting around in different places. Um, and so we continue to do that kind of very boring work every single day. There's not a silver bullet here that says, you know, this one thing is going to save us $20 million. But it just means every single one of my colleagues at the city every day just has an eye towards cost and thinking about how we can do things better. I heard, yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I know you were pushing back on the idea that this is an austerity budget, but certainly we saw a huge slash in proposed capital spending compared to previous mm -hmm. years. How is that going to be felt by Calgarians? Well, if you happen to live south of the Glenmore Reservoir, the good news is there won't be endless road construction. Uh, the bad news is because there won't be as much road construction. Um, so I want to be clear on something, though, and I'm glad you raised it, Megan, which is that as part of our response to the economic downturn, and precisely because we had squirreled away money in the good times, we were able to put a lot of money into the city budget, uh, into the city economy over the last few years of economic downturn. You know, one summer, I believe I opened five new interchanges in the city road interchanges, and I don't believe we've ever had one under construction, more than one under construction at the same time in the past. 
that was needed. It was great. I'm glad we did it. It provided stimulus to the economy. It provided jobs. And we did that in conjunction with our partners at the provincial and federal governments. Now that we're in a different phase of economic recovery, there's less need for that. So while there is far less capital spending going forward, excluding the Green Line, I have to say, remember the Green Line by itself is larger than the capital spending in any given year, much larger. But when you exclude the Green Line, certainly there is less going forward, but that is from a stimulus high. So we're moving to, I think, a more sustainable overall range of construction. Is there going to be any discussion about taking what capital dollars are currently sort of outlined as, as kind of available to play with and put it towards potentially limiting some of the operational increases that are driving the property tax increase? That's a really, really bad idea um, because capital spending is one-time spending and operational increases is every single year. So if you use one-time money to cover up every year issues in your budget, then all you're doing is creating a giant problem for yourself in the future when the one-time money runs out. So certainly if council wanted to use that one-time money for one-time things, for example, a one-time property really got a tax relief program for those outside of downtown businesses, which is what we've done in the last two years. Uh, or if they just wanted to save that money, that would be okay. But covering up the base budget taxes with that is something I would not, I would not be in favor of. How do you address, um, I'm not sure maybe what you said earlier about how this budget is structured speaks to this, but councillors' ability to understand and scrutinize this budget and the public's ability to understand and scrutinize I think it's way better. I think it's way better. Um, because, you know, in the past, it was hard to tell, you know, who's responsible for that shoveling that pathway, right? That's the example I always use. And this will be much easier. Um, I myself, you know, just got that giant binder and I'm going to have a fun weekend watching football and uh, going through every page of that binder. Um, but I find when I glance through it, when I look at it, it's actually much easier to understand. And I hope that other folks will find it as easy to understand as well.